Hi, this is Chris Dixon. This is the A16Z podcast. I'm here with Benedict Evans and Balaji Srinivasan. Um, so we've talked about this concept a lot uh, internally. We call it full stack startups. I wrote a blog post about it recently. Um, I guess just to get out of the way because people say, what is, is, is this, isn't this just another fancy word for vertical integration? Um, let me define what I mean by these, which are basically, um, there's sort of a new, I don't know, trend in startups to, um, it's, it, to have a cut, kind of a core insight that that's around technology, but then to build a company that does m- multiple activities beyond just that technology, not just sort of, you know, so instead of building software and then going out and selling that software, building a complete service around it, um, that includes things that we would traditionally not call technology functions, um, in order to go to market. So I'll give some examples. So, you know, Uber, I think is a good example where, um, prior to Uber, there were actually companies out there that built software for that they tried to license to taxi companies um, that would help you know do automated dispatching and things. Um, for a variety of reasons, those companies were not technology forward thinking. Uh, you were selling them something that they was going to replace part of their staff, maybe even the people buying it. They, they didn't catch on. Um, and then you have someone like Uber come along who, who does it sort of in this full stack way. They actually, you know, pay the drivers and do all these things. We don't think of as technology companies, um, you know, Tesla building a full car versus a lot of companies before that tried to just build electric batteries and sell them. Um, you know, you take Netflix, they, they're now, you know, both funding content, movie development, they're, they have a website where you can discover it and then they also, you know, and you can watch it and they're sort of providing the whole stack there. Whereas prior to them, there were lots of companies that tried to do things like streaming services that they licensed to, you know, Hollywood distributors or something or recommendation services for Hollywood websites or something. So Netflix going kind of full stack. Another example might be Buzzfeed. Buzzfeed actually began as a company that was trying to provide services for media properties to be more viral um, and then figured out that actually it would be better to apply it to their own media property and build that up. Um, so just a variety. Of, we recently announced our investment in Alt School, which is an attempt to kind of, ins- instead of taking technology and selling it to other schools, actually build a new school um, using that technology. Um, so I call these full-stack startups. Uh, I blogged about it. A lot of people said, isn't that vertical integration? Uh, I think vertical integration is a term – I think you could argue this, and maybe it's a boring point. Uh, The reason – one, I think vertical integration is a term that maybe is overloaded, and most people's minds refers to kind of non-technology companies that might go and acquire their suppliers or buyers, so, you know, Standard Oil or something like this. Um, I I think it's – you know, I think my mind, that's what it implies to people that it's good to have a new term. Number two, I think some of these functions that these full stack companies are doing aren't really sort of strictly the buyer or supplier. It's sort of more almost like horizontal integration in some cases. So I thought a new term was warranted. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's not, but regardless, I think it's a new phenomenon. Yeah. So, so briefly on on that point, just for a second. So I think um, there's at least two reasons why I think the term full stack is interesting. So one is that it is sort of in keeping with just how people think about software, right? You've got a full stack developer who can do the front end, the back end, everything in between. Uh, And the interesting thing about software companies in particular is that they have the option to build rather than buy many more things than previous kinds of companies. That is to say, many more things are within their core competency. As software eats the world, um, acquiring a new skill is learning a new API or being able to develop a new thing is learning a new API frequently. And so they have the option to do more of the stack. That's that's kind of point number one. And point number two is that also means that they would uh, grow into these other layers by building more than acquisition and more than the earlier things. So that's kind of, I think, one of the reasons this is interesting. Um, the third is that uh, after um, kind of a decade in which every layer of the um, – stack, uh, the computing stack was sort of split off. And so you have Cloudflare and you have AWS and you have all of these services, which um, kind of are are based on a fair degree of maturity, you know, uh, of, uh, for example, x86 and ARM architecture and so on and so forth. There's, There's some degree of maturity of those individual pieces. So you can you can, in theory, focus on a very thin slice and just work on that. Um, but when you're doing a real-world application, it's almost the opposite, right? Mm-hmm. So you actually want to be very integrative. And and I think extremely importantly, when you're going into a new industry where software has not actually been present for a while, often it is because there's a few different parts that need to get or a few different layers that need to be replaced at the same time. Now, with that said, one thing that I saw— It's interesting, you know, yeah. So you're saying it's sort of the— So 20 years ago, if you wanted to build a— You know, Amazon had to go build their— Well, not Amazon. Let's say— whatever, random startup had to go build 
their own colo or their old data center and do the whole thing. And then as each of the tools um, uh, matured, you got and you had good APIs. You didn't. You could build a thinner slice. And now we're sort of seeing the same pattern repeat uh, in, exactly. the, in the world of atoms. That's exactly right. And I think that then again, in like ten or fifteen years, you'll be able to build a uh, logistics company on top of Uber or Lyft for logistics mm-hmm. or something like that, because those things will also be reduced to APIs. But I think it, it, the, when you first move into a new vertical, um, there's so much stuff that is broken. There's reasons that software is not yet even that vertical. And you often need to go after a few different components at the same time. So with that said, one of the things that I noticed uh, in some like the comments, so I also had this like, uh, you know, long Twitter series. You had, and, a, you and had so, a mark, a P mark, a tweet storm. I, 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 41, <laughs> 41 tweets. Uh, but, you know, the reason I like actually those like multi-part, uh, you know, tweets is that um, you should just it, blog. I don't understand. Okay, yeah, right. yeah. Well, so I, I, I would blog, except first you can tweet like in the car, uh, and so you can tweet partially. You know, you can you know tweet in the house. You can tweet like a mouse, uh, like a Dr. Seuss kind of thing. But second, you can also just cut it off at any time. Okay. okay. Yeah, so that's that's like it's, you know a blog. You have to edit it more. Uh, but anyway, they're all drafts of like MOOC lectures. But um, regarding the kind of some of the responses to the uh, the Twitter posts, I saw a lot of people who were saying, oh, you know, the equivalent of, yes, I want to build a uranium mine. Now you're telling me, yes, we can go and fund it. I'm not against like extremely ambitious initial things, but I want to clarify that doing a full stack startup does not mean um, like uh, take Uber, for example. Yes, they, they did the, the full stack, but they didn't buy 100,000 cars on day one, right? They uh, you know, they figured out, okay, here is an ultimate ambition. Uh, maybe they weren't even thinking about 100,000 cars at the beginning. But they picked the minimum number of layers to replace at the beginning. They had the ambition of doing the whole thing ultimately. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really what distinguishes it. You still want to have a minimum viable product. It just, maybe it's not quite as minimum, yeah. but you you want to have a plan for getting to those other layers. Mm-hmm. And in the interim, you use the stop gaps. You use the things that are commercial off the shelf. You use the things but that some, are best but some of these things, like, the, like Tesla to versus A123 batteries or something, like the Tesla, you just have the minimum viable product is a really nice car. Like, and right. it's not, and it's pretty ambitious. So, but even then, you can stage it. You can say, hey, look, we're going to show the engine works. Yeah. Okay. And that's going to And they started the out. high end for like the niche yeah. wealthy people or something. Exactly. Presumably, they're going to have a very mainstream, and, and for example, expensive car at some point. Like, you know, even starting with, I'm sure, you know, I, I didn't see Tesla's, you know, roadmap and so on and so forth, but I'm sure that there was staging where they said, okay, first let's prove out superchargers in yeah. California, right? And yeah. let's do but, it in a network in California but, but before actually, it's I mean, it's even be, it's even beyond that because they, you know they started the first car they didn't make half of the components so ah. there's been a steady oh, rollout yeah. yes. okay. okay. of you Good. know they start with like well let's do a roadster mm. and we'll buy in half the bits and yep. then you kind of step slowly mm. through and you know there's an end point somewhere in Elon, Elon Musk's mind that you know he's making as many cars as Toyota yes. but you know how do you get there um, I mean there's a sort of there's, in a sense this isn't really unique to technology and there's always been kind of asset heavy and asset light models mm. in here and, you know obviously Uber doesn't own the cars. Um, and it's interesting to look at they're, today, now, they're now buying cars. Oh, they're now, but they're yeah. now thinking about leasing. But it's interesting looking at at, at, at Airbnb and comparing that with, say, a big hotel chain like you know a Marriott or, or a Hilton because they don't own the hotels. Yeah. Um, you know, they've got you know dozens or hundreds of franchisees who've gone out uh, who are individual real estate developers who've gone out and raised some money. Um, and so there's always that kind of tension of well, how far into that do you actually need to go? Right. If you look at Apple, we would think of Apple as being the ultimate integrated company but they don't own any of the factories i mean they you know they own a few things Mm -hmm. but you know most of the places where iphones are made they don't own and they put capital in or they own well i think where do you where do you put the where do you draw the ownership line where do you put the inventory where is it held how what can you do you know back to apple you know apple's the world's biggest sap installation so that that degree of of um disaggregation of manufacturing at apple is in turn a function of software yeah, and, so, and you're right. Though the Apple is clearly the the canonical full stack technology company. The um, I think the way the the principle they use to decide which parts of the chain they have to own and which parts they can outsource is just ultimate product. What ultimate product experience do I need to deliver, and which of the you know which of the layers to Bology's point are mature enough that I can use their quote API. Hmm. So maybe the China factories they decide the API is mature enough. Right. Um, but you know, for the clearly for the co- the main core processor, that wasn't. Yeah, they brought that in. Enough, yeah. So there's kind of there's kind of a bundling and unbundling thing going on. I mean, the, yeah. the thing that you see in media and telecoms is you know clearly the, an unbundling of things that were previously bundled that's enabled by the internet and enabled by by smartphones and so on. So you mm-hmm. have um, you know magazines and newspapers. 
So you and know, on the one hand, or you know, data and SMS and voice on the other, getting pulled apart into the component pieces. One of the things I think that's underappreciated about um, full stack startups in particular is: so why do you need them to move into a new vertical? Often, not always, but often, um, Airbnb, for example, is moving into a new vertical without doing the whole thing, but they're doing probably more of it than. Um, other web competitors have, have gone to. For example, they sent photographers uh, to people's houses and yep. they photographed them. And they, they were a lot more invasive about that than pre- people were before. And that was an enormous component of making the listings look attractive and so on and so forth. And now they're getting even more invasive, or maybe invasive is not the right term. Let's say um, they're being more considerate of the full experience by thinking about it as a hospitality experience. They're giving guidelines for their hosts and they're saying, you know, here's the cleaning staff and we'll provide cleaning services and so on and so forth. So, you know, th- there's, um, I think the law logic of providing a good customer experience often means that full stack. And one of the reasons for that is that if the more layers you can operate, you can propagate feedback from one layer to another. So I'll give two examples I think of a, a lot. One is um, so the development of like the MagSafe you know, cable. Uh, as I understand it, um, because Apple controlled uh, the Genius Bar, they had people who would come in and uh, they would be able to log all the defects that happened with Apple computers, right? And they found that uh, a relatively small number of defects, but with a very high dollar value, were caused by people yanking the computer off the desk. And so they propagated this from the retail level, right? The like highest level of the business, all the way down to the very lowest level of the business, i.e. solid state physics, right? To develop a new device, right? to then sell and propagate all the way yeah. back up to this layer that sensed it, right? As another example, um, so when running council, the fact that we controlled the entire stack all the way from mixing reagents and procuring reagents and, and doing that ourselves up through robotics and sequencing and so on and so forth, up through the national sales force and like clinical integration and so on, meant that, you know, for example, when doctors asked us for a turnaround time improvement, right, because people needed to have a baby, you know, rapidly, um, if it was like an IVF, you know, cycle or something like that, uh, we could go and we could, you know, take certain reactions and put them into triplicate rather than serial. And so we could optimize things at the reagent level to, to fix things that were at the patient level. And so like controlling all the layers like that, I think is very helpful. And in the, uh, a new business, um, the one challenge in doing it is you need managers of these different layers that are very competent. And, you know, initially as an executive, you need to actually be able to articulate that you need a robotics expert when nobody in the industry has hired a robotics expert in quite this way before, right? So I think like, I think of recruiting as one of the most difficult challenges associated with building a full stack startup because you need to have expertise. You need to, you need to know what you lack expertise in. Well, that's the other interesting thing though, is if you can do it, it's very, very hard to compete against because you've got to, you've got to do sort of this like, it's this and function of like this and this and this, like, you know, you want to go head to head with, you know, Apple, like, I guess you can take the radically different approach like Google, which is you try to break the stack up in different ways with Android. Um, but in general, like you got to be good at branding, you got to be good at semiconductors, you got to be good at operating systems, you got to be good at apps, like there's a lot of things. And it, and it really is, uh, um, you know, goes against the whole kind of business school theory of like have a single core competency and do it well. And, and Google is arguably pretty full stack themselves. I mean, they build their own data centers, they build their own hardware yeah. and chips and routers and all this type of stuff. I was going to say, I mean, looking specifically at startups, isn't part of this a function of the collapse of, in cost of actually getting something out of the door? Um, so, you know, you could look at, at Airbnb or Uber or, you know, any of these companies and say, well, 10 years ago, um, it would have taken you $100 million just to get the app out of the door. Yeah, yeah. Right. Today, yeah. you can get that out of the door yeah. for five. And, and so actually yeah. the amount of capital that you can deploy to spread out in yeah. all directions is completely different. Yep. And, and in parallel with that, you know, just the size of the addressable market now means that it's actually feasible to do something like Airbnb. You That's know, you true. could not have done Airbnb 15 years ago. You couldn't have done Uber Well, and it also it affects like our job as VCs, um, you know, I think we people like us are willing to because the markets are so huge you know yeah. write these hundred million dollar checks knowing these can be you know many tens of billions of dollars yeah. in value companies. Yeah, exactly whereas if you tried to do airbnb yeah. 10 years ago you'd have got to you've got an in there to be in a, a tiny addressable market and it would have cost you 10 times as much to get to the product that you see today so you just couldn't have done it so, yeah. So the next question is, when, where do we think the next wave of, like, what industries will the next wave of full stock startups be? I'll just give you my bias view, which is, or my bias, which is, um, so I think the best lens to look at this through is the Carlotta Perez lens of, um, basically, she divides every technology revolution into two phases, the installation phase, which always corresponds with the financial bubble. And there's always a crash, and then there's like a long period of the deployment phase where you're kind of then taking the uh, fruits of that technology and, and deploying it throughout the economy. 
Um, so the automobile in the automobile revolution, the first phase happened in Detroit. It was around building better cars. The second phase happened over the next 50 years, which is about building the highway system and suburbs and trucking systems and logistics and fast food and best and big box retail and all these other things that happen as a result and happen, by the way, all over the place in different industries. And to me, what I think of full stack startups is kind of the uh, what we've learned to be one of the optimal deployment phase strategies. Yeah. Um, now that we're going into healthcare, healthcare is a very, very complicated industry where you could argue a lot of parts of it um, have misaligned incentives, have people who are averse to technology. Um, in many cases, the, you know, one of the trickiest parts is if you, it's one thing to have a breakthrough. You, you invent a new there – there exist expert systems that can diagnose illness better than any doctor, and yet they're not, never used. Why? Because what are you going to do, sell it to doctors to replace themselves? Like, right. There's all sorts of technologies that just aren't out there now. Um, and I think the full stack – approach is the answer. Yeah. Um, I think in particular with healthcare, right, it's an industry where you have third-party payment and fourth-party pricing and fifth-party regulation in the sense that pricing is set by CPT and regulation is by a number of bodies and, um, you know, payment is by insurers. And so you have, like, when you're talking to the doctor, there's actually, like, three other people, maybe f- you know, four in that in that room with you effectively, right? The doctor doesn't know the price. You don't know the price. Nobody knows the price of anything. And so going full stack, like something like Kaiser, for example, actually does start to get aligned incentives because they aren't just paying for it. They're also doing the treatment. And so they start to actually, you know, close the loop on yeah. this. Um, I would say that three industries in particular that are very good candidates for um, – you know, full stack startups are finance, uh, education, healthcare, um, and these three have a few things in common. First, they're information heavy businesses, yeah. which are good for a software approach. Second, they have regulations which uh, can be um, partially automated in terms of compliance uh, via software internally. Um, third, they're very large markets. Uh, fourth, we're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs in them. And fifth is they don't require that much in the way of physical components. They're still actually pretty friendly to software. I mean, old school is actually building schools, but it's not quite at the same level. I would, I would as, also say know. that those three industries are the ones where the the, the it's striking how little they have changed. Yeah. In the you know the greatest uh, invention in the history of of information delivery, the internet. Um, you would have expected it to have chained to have had a major impact on those information heavy businesses, yet it hasn't. Right. Like think about the way healthcare is really not that different or finance than it was. I mean, yeah, they have online brokers and things like this, but the fundamental structure has not changed in the way, for example, in media is just dramatically different, yeah. right? Um, and so I think that to me, the disparity between those two things, the fact that they're information intensive and the fact that so little has changed right. means they are they are by far the right targets. Now, that said, they're very difficult. I think you refer to them as boss mode, boss level yeah. in the video game. Like, right. this is the tough one. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, this is the big, big, scary dragon that you have to, you know, fight on the last level. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, like, I think, um, so what would be, like, I think a relatively, so finance, education, healthcare, I think are quite difficult. I think that's, like, about the level of sector that we can take on right now. I would say that what I think of as probably infeasible right now is, like, um, nuclear power plant, right? Yeah. Like, energy and transportation, like aviation, like, at the level like a Boeing or something like that, very large physical businesses are still not, I think, good candidates for this right now. I mean, there's obviously exceptions. You've got your, you know, Musks, and, you, you know, you've got people who are doing interesting things with drones and so on and so forth. Um, but generally speaking, like, I think that right sweet spot is like finance, education, healthcare, things in that area. 